Okay, Lynn, do you want to fire away? Well, good evening from London and welcome to another Harif lockdown lecture. Uh, perhaps we should change the name by now since nobody's in lockdown, but anyway, it's, it's like a brand, isn't it? Um, so, um, yes, welcome to, um, to our um, lockdown lecture on um, a very interesting subject tonight. Um, we're all going to go to Tunisia. Um, this, is, this is an armchair travelogue. And we have an expert guide um, called Nigel Grizzard, who will take us along and share his impressions and his thoughts about his trip to Tunisia. First of all, just a few housekeeping points. This is being recorded and the video will be uploaded to our Harif uh, website, which is www.harif.org. Please do check it out. Do check out our sister website, Point of No Return, which keeps you up to date uh, with the news. There will be an opportunity to ask uh, Nigel some questions. Uh, please do pop your questions in the chat, which is the button at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Nigel, who many of you will remember has already given us a couple of talks. Um, he is a, an expert on Jewish heritage, particularly in the north of England. He is actually, he lives in Leeds. Um, and he is, um, I think, an honorary Sephardi because he's, he's done quite a lot of research into the Sephardi community in the north. So um, sit back and enjoy our trip to Tunisia and uh, our pilgrimage to the Algriva uh, Synagogue, which I believe is one of the oldest in North Africa. So without further ado, over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Let me first share the screen for my uh, Gerba PowerPoint. And we'll start the slideshow from the beginning. And uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to talk to everyone, and it's great to, uh, you know, to tell about my adventure in Tunisia. So this first picture is about a group of French pilgrims coming to the Griba, which is an event held annually on Lagba Oma, on the 33rd day of the Oma, which was May the 18th, 2022. I'd actually been to Gerba before, I'd been in the year 2014, it was a different time then. It was before there'd been a huge terrorist atrocity against especially UK tourists in Tunisia. And it was a time when everyone was very hopeful. And I had a wonderful time there. I'd met a lot of French Jews of Tunisian origin who'd returned. Uh, I'd also met many Israelis who'd come that time, who even though the Tunisian government had said Israelis are banned from entering Tunisia, they all seemed miraculously to have turned up. So on we go. And this is a presentation by me. I went for a week to the city of Tunis, which is the capital, and to Gerba. We flew from London to Tunis, and then we flew from G Tunis to Gerba. I was uh, a guest of the National Tourist Office. I attended the Lad Boma Gruber event on behalf of the Jewish Telegraph, which has editions in Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, and Glasgow. And uh, it's a bit like Heineken, it seems to get everywhere. And there were many other Jewish journalists and exciting people present. I uh, met a guy who ran a Jewish website in Copenhagen. There was a colleague from the Jewish Chronicle there. I met uh, people who were involved in the genealogy of Tunisian Jewry and were trying to bring things up. And very interestingly also, uh, I go to a shear in Leeds run by Rabbi Yol Top. Yol's, uh, Mum had left Tunis with her uncle in 1960, and I kept sending photos back to Yol to show his mum and uncle, and that, that was a very interesting thing. So maybe I want to say a bit about the flight from London to Tunis, because that in itself was interesting. You meet a lot of interesting people there. It was a regular flight, not a charter tourist flight. I remember talking to a guy from Libya who told me he now lived in the UK. He sold power stations. He was going from Tunis 
and then frankly tunis to tripoli and was intent on selling them modern libyan modern power stations for a rebuilt libya and then we both discussed whether he would be going to ukraine after that to rebuild the infrastructure and he thought that if they got the russians out he would be going there and it's just interesting that you meet so many people we also met uh, a helper from the tunisian national tourist office and she told me she was from damascus and i don't normally people who meet people from all these locations but it was great to meet them all and we had a wonderful time i was looked after by monsef batik who's the tunisian national tourist officer's head in london and uh, you know can't recommend the place enough but on we go so this is tunisia it's sandwiched between libya and algeria you've got the main capital city of tunis on the coast you have some amazing places uh, la massa we went to all sorts of wonderful you know sites and hotels in the north and then we flew down to jerba island which is the 50 minutes on the plane and about 200 kilometers and we arrived down there and that was our destination for the week. And that was where the Jews were heading. And that was where also there was the Griba, the uh, Lagba Oma celebration. So moving on, lots and lots of food. And I put pictures of food to show you. And they're very, care very pleasantly for us, as well as the regular food, most of which you can eat because it's vegetarian. When we had a special do, we had a Kasha, sta a kasha station and many of the French groups had brought all their, their chefs along and there was kosher food in the hotel. And, you know, wonderful things you see, table decor, things that I saw in the hotels and I thought, this is great. These are the sort of things you want to have in your house. And moving on, a bit more food just to whet the appetite, fruit, dates, melons in the morning, lots of uh, baguettes, lots of croissants, lots of rolls, all sorts of things to eat. And you know, you were have we, you know we had three meals a day. I uh, put a lot of weight, and you can't you know hospitality was tremendous. And this is important for later on why the food is important. And we lived the high life. They put us here in the Ministry of Tourism, the hotel sank at twelve five stars, and you know huge insides with the sort of Muslim style architecture, which I like, and uh, lots of design. And in fact, if any of you go in the synagogue in Bradford, which was built for German Jews in 1881, you'll see the same, the same style. They built the synagogue in Bradford out of a sort of Muslim Islamic style. It's what's called Islamic geometric style. Why Bradford had that, I don't know, but it reminded me of home when I saw all these places in Tunisia. So how many Jewish Jews in Tunisia? At the height, after World War II, the community numbered a maximum of 105,000 Jews, which was, uh, they say, you know, was a fair proportion of the population. But obviously, after independence, 1956, there were 20, by 1967, there were 27,000 left. But after um, the Six Day War, the majority of Jews were left. And if you look through, I suppose, you know, the Arab world, you'll see that 67 was the year when Jews realized there was anti-Jewish writing across many places and the majority left. And today's figures are given of 2000 Jews in Tunisia. Whether that's true, whether it's not, I don't know, but uh, that's the figure that's given and that's the figure that we'll stick with. And uh, I show you, you know, Tunisian independence, 1956 was 66 years ago. Interesting that anyone who left the independence, you know, must be at least 66 years of age and uh, anyone who left in the Six Day War in 1967 left 55 years ago or left after. So it's a long time since people have left. And, uh, you know, the client group who were born there are comparatively elderly, but the children aren't. But very interestingly, I sent photos back to my friend Rabbi Yoltop. He showed them all to his mum and uncle. And he said they never had any interest in going back to Tunisia. They'd gone from Tunisia to France. And then his mama married a guy from Leeds and ended up in Leeds where she became the caterer. But when she started seeing these photos, she said, she told, she told her son, you know, now I want to go back. Now there's an opportunity to go. And that, that to me was very, very interesting. You know, that people feel maybe so much time has gone up, has, has elapsed, so much water's gone onto the bridge that it's a time to go back and a time to, you know, look at their roots. So, 
Very interestingly, we had a press conference with the Minister of Tourism. These are two lovely ladies in traditional German dress. And why did we have a press conference? We had a press conference for two reasons. To launch the uh, Tunisian tourism season. Tunisia had been plagued by two things. 2014, when I went there, everything was going comparatively well. 2015, terrorism appears. And uh, they used the Jewish event to, lose, to launch Tunisia's post-pandemic tourist offer. As I said, the country suffered from the lack of tourists caused by both the pandemic, which stopped tourism, and the problems of terrorism in the past. And I went back and I read the piece from the BBC about it listed 30 Britons who'd been murdered in a hotel. 38 people were murdered in the attack at all. And when you read that, you understand, you know, the reluctance of the British tour companies to come and the horrendous nature of the tourism, as you saw that there were families, literally and couples, just wiped out from across the, uh, the spectrum of Britain. Tunisia also has a neighbour, Libya, which much as I'd like to visit Tripoli and Benghazi and see the Jewish sites, we know that it is unstable. And interestingly, while we were there, there, were, there was fighting between groups in Tripoli. And then I put, read the Foreign Office travel advice. And if you read that, it tells you the places in the country you shouldn't go. And even if you, and places you can only go if you have to, and then the rest of it, well, it's possible to go there, but it's not really safe. So, uh, be sure, you know, you're, you're careful when we're going to religious gatherings, where foreigners are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that was the climate. And that's why the Tunisia's tourist office, and we had the minister there, wanted to use the grievance to say, well, if the Jews will come, and they'd come in organized groups from France in their thousands, then maybe the other people should look at coming. And when you drive around and you see the five-star hotels and you see, see the food and you see you know, the quad bikes lined up, but no one's using them because the tourists aren't coming. And I believe that we were invited to the Griba because they wanted us to come on to say it's good and to talk to other people and to use our influence to talk to maybe some of the contacts that we have, and I'll come to that, to make sure that the Brits go back to Tunisia. And if you look here, there's a map showing Tunisia travel advice and uh, the red bits, it says, advise against all travel, the orange mix says advice against all but essential travel. And the green mix, it says, see our travel advice before traveling. So uh, if you're worried about traveling, if you want, you know, if you want an easy holiday, you know, then uh, at the moment, because of the foreign office, we're not flying mainly to Tunisia. And uh, I think, you know, that was, uh, you know, that's something that we have to conquer. I also think, you know, that unfortunately there's been terrorism in Britain, but, uh, and we conquer that. And I think the Tunisians, to their credit, and I'll show you some pictures, are doing something to conquer that. So moving on, there's a rapprochement between the Tunisians and the Jews. The Jews left, and I think now the Tunisians see the Jews as a way to come back, as a way to be the leaders in a movement to bring the people back. I put particularly the Jews, and I put the Madden Delvey, rather than the flag of Israel, because I'm not sure about the links between Israel and Tunisia. I remember in 2014, there was some balagan and the Tunisians said, you know, they're not going to allow the Israelis in. And, it was, and I remember the next day, it was midnight, it was the time of the Griba. I was sitting in uh, the casino in the island of Jerba. An old Israeli Ashkenazi guy was with me. The Tunisian Jews were talking to the Tunisians in Tunisian Arabic. The Tunisians were saying, you are home. The Jews were saying, they are home. We were in a room full of Tunisian flags and there'd been all this balagan in the press. And the Israeli guy looked at me and said, you know, I'm on a sugar, you know, is this really happening? And the answer was, it was. And very interestingly, I reread my article and then I saw that after we'd had this long discussion between the Tunisian Jews and the uh, Tunisians, some of the Parisians all have come in their finery and bless them, they uh, know how to dress and they know how to wear gold, started belly dancing. And there are a number of religious or Dutty Jewish girls from Paris in the room as well. And I'm not sure they thought uh, they were sure where to put themselves. But there is this rapprochement between Tunisians and the Jews. Because we came like as a football team, I wasn't able to discuss everything further. 
But, you know, the whole question of links with Israel, where we go, that sort of thing, that's for the next phase. It didn't happen in the Islamic Accord, in the Abrahamic Accords, as you know. Morocco got that prize, Dubai got it. Tunisia, we have to see. And maybe someone of the audience who knows more about the politics can tell me on that. Moving on, there are Jewish jewelry shops in Tunisia, certainly in Jerba. And here's, here I bought, I bought a Hamza for my wife inside a Jewish jewelry shop. But again, it's interesting looking at the Jewish jewelry shop and comparing experiences. A few years ago, I was in West 46th Street in New York. I went into the what was the Jewish uh, diamond and, well, not diamond, the Jewish jewelry books. And whereas before, nearly everyone was a religious Jew, now there were Puerto Ricans in there, there were people with crosses. It had gone down the Jewish trade. I remember in Leeds, uh, I came, I had a friend. Her father had five jewelry shops in the city and in the neighboring town of Halifax. And nearly every independent jeweler in Leeds was Jewish. They've all gone and we now have the chains. So Beaverbrook, Samuels, that sort of thing. So one wonders what is the future for these small Jewish jewelry shops? And one of the questions for them is if there are no tourists, there is no future because that's who they sell to. So this is a lovely guy who I bought from called Moshe. He also had some Armanut, he had a uh, spice box. He had, uh, you can see there, there's a hamsa there, there are some hamsas there. And uh, he had a silver jug, which was for the Maya Mahronim, that you had to, that you wash yourself with before when you say Brichat Hamozon, the venture. So all sorts of omelot still being made in Jerba, in Tunisia, for Jews. Going on, I found another picture, the bijouterie, the jewelry shop of Nahum Shelley, and, uh, and if you say, and if you see on the left in Hebrew, it says Hanote Nachum Sheli. And then the rest of it is in Arabic. And that was the tourist who were in front of it. And these shops are kitted out with tons and tons of, uh, of exciting wares to buy. Moving on, I put, took some pictures of the Jerba Shuk, full of, full of things, nicely priced, lots of garments, lots of exciting things, and also lots of exciting crockery and all sorts of artifacts, tagines, plates, everything you could want for the home. You've got to remember to bring some bubble wrap because they don't know how to wrap, to wrap it for the plane. So remember, if you're going, bring some bubble wrap when you to wrap everything in. Lots of bags and purses. I don't know how many of you uh, heard Howard Jacobson speak, but uh, he's very interested in bags and purses because he sold them through with his father on the markets in the north of England. But here we have all of the bags and purses and we also have the copies as well, uh, which you tend to find in many countries and even in Manchester in the UK, but I shouldn't say that. And then I went to the Jewish school and this for me was the highlights of my tour. We had a Jewish officer with Rabbi Cohen who was originally from Jerba, he was a Cohen. Like many of the Jerba people of Kahanim, he'd come from Israel and he was examining the boys, talking to them about the Torah. I say Jewish Ofsted because Ofsted inspectors, when they come to Jewish schools, seem to come with a different agenda and they don't know how to react with Jews, especially religious Jews. But Rabbi Cohen with these boys was wonderful. And uh, we have another class. So there are at least five or six classes of Jewish boys in the school. And then we have the wonderful thing, the Rav blessing the Talmud in the pupils. He stands up. And he says, And to me and to anyone else in the room, it was the great, great, great thing. And I put some people on. That to me was like the most important thing I saw because it was living young Jews, not old Jews from France coming to visit a shrine and to light candles and to decorate eggs, which is a big tradition to get your family married. But uh, to me, this was a great thing. I've got another one, another picture, and you can see an Israeli journalist taking a picture or recording it on his phone. And another one here, I've been blessing the boys, and I took that because it says Masechta Baba, Baba Metzia, the tractate of Baba Metzia from the uh, Talmud Bavli. And for anyone who's a, who's a scholar, they'll know that's one of the great early things that you can learn. And to me, you know, seeing young Jews in Tunisia, that's fantastic. But the question for me is, where are they going to go? 
Are they going to stay or are they going to go? So we move on to discuss that. And also in the shawl, uh, I saw a plaque. It says to the memory of Morris and Vivian Wall of London and Geneva. And my aunt used to live in a block of flats in Hendon. It was called Wall Court. There's also a, a Wall Institute. The Wall have founded, uh, I think they founded the new Jewish care headquarters in Golders Green. So it's interesting to see that there's a London Geneva link. And another plaque, and we've talked a lot about the Cairo Gazoo Geniza, and here in Tunis, there was another Geniza. Whether it goes back a thousand years, I very much doubt. But they have a Geniza where they can throw everything in, and maybe that's a thing for scholars to explore. So Lynn asked me, how many Jews are there in Jerba today? And I kept asking that question. And they said, a thousand Jews. Mil Juif, Elif Yehudim. How true that is, I don't know. But when I looked around the school and saw about 150 teenage boys, I thought maybe that is of the right order. Because, uh, you know, 150 seems boys, 1,000 Jews seems right, and 1,000 is good because it's a sizable community. It's not like somewhere where, you know, there are 10 or 15 or 100 Jews. It's enough to support itself, to have services, to have business. But the question to me is, are the young people going to stay? If you look at young Jews in the north of England, they move. Young Jews in small towns everywhere, they move. They head for capital cities, or they head for Israel, or sometimes they head for the United States. And I would think that if I was a young Jew in Jerba today, I'm looking to the future, I think maybe my future was in Paris or my future was in Israel. I haven't had enough time to sit down because we were like a circus barging into the school. It wasn't possible to have, you know, easy discussions, but I'd like to ask them, what's their future? And interestingly, I found an article from 2016 where they said exactly that question, what is the future? But there are a thousand Jews now, and you know, they seem to be having young kids, so let's hope there is the community. And it was great to go there because it was like seeing a Jewish community within the, the Arab world, something we hear a lot about, but we never normally see. So moving forward, there was a nice picture here. He was bronzing. There was a cow's head outside the kosher butcher shop. And this guy was, uh, was heating it all up. You see a lot of cow's heads in butcher shops. He then went to the synagogue like Griba. And this is where all the events are. Decorated with Tunisian flags. Built in the 1880s. And again, very similar inside. The, 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 it's been many parts of that. Appear the same. There are the same sayings as in the Bradford synagogue which is also from 1880, because it was a style. This plaque was new since I've been up, came last time. This is inside part of the synagogue. You go through it into a shrine before, and you see all the people there, mainly French, Tunisian Jews, other Sephardi Jews. If you're an Ashkenazi Jew and, and didn't speak French, I think you'd feel out of it. And one of the interesting things in Tunisia was I relearned my French, because I either had to speak French or Tunisian Arabic, I know a few words of Arabic, such as shwaya, shwaya, which I was taught when I rode a donkey through the stick in, in Petra. You say shwaya, shwaya to the donkey for it to go slowly. And I knew shukran, which meant thank you. And I kept saying that to all the people who were very helpful. The rest of the time I spoke in French, because to be truthful, very few people spoke in English, because the English don't go there. These are French Jewish pilgrims. This time they'd all come with t-shirts, they'd come with groups. They'd come for a week to Jerba. They had kosher food in the hotel. They had a whole program of activities because the Griba is on May the 18th on Lagba Omer. There's a set, they carry the Torah, they sing, they dance, they go, they pray in the synagogue, but they have to have something more to come to this wonderful holy island. So going on, there is a synagogue courtyard. Last time I was there, there were just people this time there were there were there was food, there were stalls, things had gone up a gear, and I learned the French word uh, for what I call. No one knew what shishlik was, so I called it a brochette, which is what they called it. And there was wonderful meat there, all kosher and all able to eat for the visitors. This is a plaque that I found in the synagogue. It's a, a benediction for the president of uh, the republic, who at the time was Habib Bourguiba. He was uh, the first president of Tunisia. He was there, a man, when the French left, he was certainly there 
in 67. And as you know, Tunisia went through a whole turmoil in 2011. Now, security. This is a very, very interesting issue. There is tremendous security in Jerba, especially when the Jews are there. Every roundabout we went at was manned by the police and by armed police at that. And uh, this was a picture of a police vehicle in Jerba. Now, those of you who live in London will know that to Boris Johnston at one stage, when he was mayor, ordered three water cannons. There was a whole uh, hoo-ha about it. They were never used and they were sold. But this is a police vehicle in Jerba. I'm going to show it to my colleagues who guard the synagogue in Bradford who are involved in neighborhood policing, because I don't think in the West Yorkshire Force they have anything like that. But the reality is that if terrorism comes in Tunisia, it's not one mad guy with an ax. It could be 30 people from Libya heavily armed. And the police were there. This was actually taken outside the Jewish school. I saw similar vehicles. I saw Humvees. I saw you know, a huge amount of uh, security equipment out there in Jerba. And they are very, very keen that their tourists should be safe and preserved. Interestingly, at the same time we were there, there was the cultural program. They showed a film and they had liturgical chants of the Jews of Jerba, which produced, performed by an Arab group, which I heard. And uh, I'd studied at Queen Mary College, and it was interesting to see that the person who'd been behind it was Daniel Lee, who's a lecturer in history at Queen Mary College. And there are a number of people at Queen Mary College, which is part of the University of London there. Whether it worked, I'm not sure, because there was tremendous security People found it difficult to get into the hotels to see them. But there was, for the first time, I think, you know, and there was also a symposium with it. There were events looking at the, the history of the Jews of Jerba, looking at German Jewish films. Whether the French people who come were interested, I'm not sure. But, you know, there's now, when Daniel should come and lecture on it, you know, an intellectual component to this thing. We also went to Flamingo Island. We had a lot of treats. And uh, I thought I'd show you these because we went on a galleon and because we were Jews, we had two police launchers there. We had one launcher on our left and we had a guy on, uh, what do you call them, you know, on like a power scooter on the right. They were very, very keen to look after us. And I think they felt that, you know, heaven forbid anything should happen, they should be there. The other thing very interestingly was, uh, I don't know whether any of you remember about Ambassador Stevens. But Ambassador Stevens was the US ambassador. In 2012, he was killed in Benghazi. It's one of the first, one of the, one of the few US ambassadors to die. And if you read the proceedings, you see that uh, although he had some protection of a gut and there was a guard around him, they had uh, a fighting force, but the force was further away. They called the CIA for permission to send them in. The CIA delayed for 10 minutes. And by the time the force actually got there, Ambassador Stevens was dead. So the Tunisians realize that you've got to have active security, not uh, hidden away, but uh, you know, out there, whether it's at the roundabouts, whether it's at the Jewish school, certainly when all the visitors are coming, because that is the time you know, that they worry most. But there is security throughout the place. So uh, two interesting launches that followed us. Now, having been in Jerba, we remember, went back to Tunis, a great city, a city that feels like the south of the south of France. I took a picture here of, of the city centre. And then we went to a place called La Safsaf in Tunis. This is in a suburb by the sea called La Massa. My our tour guide knew that this guy was Jewish by his accent. I had a chat with him. He's one of the remaining thousand or however many Jews that are in Tunis who'd stayed. You know, in these situations, you're not able to say, well, why are you here? Why aren't you in Israel or in Paris? The fact is that he's Jewish, he's there, he's proud to be Jewish. And this area on Saf Saf was, I suppose, if you know that the gold is, gold is green, is a meeting place for Jews. There are Jewish places, meeting places all over the world. So the Saf Saf in Tunis was this area where Jews came. And there's also a synagogue still functioning in the Saf Saf. So moving on, I took a picture when I left Jerba on the Friday of the departure board. And it runs Tunis 8.15, Paris only 9.40, Tunis 11 o'clock, Frankfurt 14.20, Paris Charles de Gaulle 2.30, Brussels 3 o'clock, Tunis 5 o'clock, Paris only 8, 6 o'clock, 
Tallinn, Estonia, 650, and Tunis, 2050. The red is our plane, which was delayed three hours. But you know, when you travel, this is life. But the interesting thing to me was this was a big airport. This was an airport that needed people, that was prepared for flights. And this was an, air, an airport that the Tunisians desperately wanted the tourists to come back to, to reinvigorate their economy. I'll say one other thing, Tunisian uh, customs and immigration works on a paper-based system. And uh, well, I've been to other places. When I went to Georgia in the former Soviet Union, you know, they just took my passport and whisked it through the computer. But here in uh, Gerber and in Tunis, we had to fill out tons of forms. They asked me all sorts of questions. When I said I was a journalist, they said, who did I write for? Was it television? Was it newspapers? And on and on it went. And when, actually when we left Tunis, because we had uh, links through our tourism guide with the airport, they took us through the diplomatic channel. So we didn't get any of the hassle. But if they're gonna expect tourists and they're gonna be having flights coming in from Britain, they have to sort out the immigration, certainly for Europeans. And they have to make direct flights. So we were there, but the big challenge in Tunisia is how to get the tourists back. From Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden, from Italy and the former Yugoslavia, from the United States, Great Britain, and Ireland. And this is the challenge for Tunisia and Gerba, and it's the challenge for the Jewish community in Gerba, because with no tourists, there is no economy, and you know, how long they'll stay, I don't know. And um, I put this as the prize. Tunisia wants UK visitors. JetTube.com, friendly low fares. It's an airline based in Leeds, and it flies from Belfast International, Birmingham, Bristol, East Midlands, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Leeds, Bradford, London, Stansted, Manchester, Newcastle. And uh, Jet2 have departure points in the UK, that's their points. Tunisia and certainly Gerba offer sea, sun, sand, shopping and great food. What more do the Brits want? I also put a picture of uh, get the beers in because drink is cheap there. People want, Brits want to treat, treat the beer. Their wives want to go off shopping in the souks. Maybe the husbands come with them, I don't know. But there's, you know, there's an opportunity to do water sports. There's a water park, there are islands to go to. It's fabulous. And the key thing is, how do they get the Brits back? And that's one of the challenges that I have to do talking to colleagues at Jet2 here in Leeds. So to finish up, how do we exploit the Jewish tourism market for Tunisia? And that's very interesting because the French Jews are coming. Will they allow Israeli Jews with tourists? With, Tunisian origin to come. Yes, if they've got French passports or other passports, but Israeli tour tourists with Israeli passports, we don't know. Whether other Jews will come, maybe. For Anglo Jews or Ashkenazi, very interesting question, whether they, they would relate to it. But they've got the challenge. How long will the Jewish community of Jerba last? One of the few authentic Jewish communities left in the Arab world. They've been there for over two and a half thousand years. And they were high, there are 5,000 Jews. Today, there are 1,000. Links between Tunisia and Israel. Very interesting one. It's been a rocky, rocky road. But uh, Tunisia, you know, it's, it's a possibility. There have been problems in the past, and we can go through those. But you have to look to the future. And you think, well, if Israel has relations with Morocco, and many Moroccan Jews come back on a pilgrimage, Will they have links with Tunisia? And you know, nothing is impossible. And my final question to Lynn is will be Harif be organizing a trip for 5783-2023, where we can all come as uh, an English Jewish group from Harif to visit the Griba. So now over to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Nigel. I think you did a very good job for the um, Tunisian Tourist Board. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to answer your question, are we going to be organizing a tour to Tunisia? Well, we're not in the travel business yet. I think it's bad enough trying to organize Zooms. <laughs> but you never know, it might happen in the future. So my question to you is, did you get a feeling that um, there was a pro-normalization trend in, in Tunisia? Or has the president of Tunisia, who's known to be 
really anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic. Do you think he has put a damper on, on any, any sort of uh, um, trend towards normalization? Well, I didn't get a, a chance to talk to government officials. I listened to my tour guide and uh, it was at the time that the journalists had been shot in Janine. It had been the time when her funeral had been disrupted. It wasn't necessarily, whenever I go to Tunisia, there seems to be some, something, you know, burning in the, in the Middle East that, that has a link forward. I didn't, didn't get a chance to discuss that. But one very interesting thing on Islam, I do a lot of work in Bradford. I do a lot of work with school groups. I meet the majority of Muslim children I meet even from junior school upwards, wear hijabs. And, uh, you know, if you go to places such as Batley and Dewsbury in the adjoining, the adjoining authority of Kirk Lees, lots of the girls, you know, are wearing uh, black robes. When I went to Tunisia, they were in the minority. Some people were wearing hijabs, but lots of girls were without headscarves, wearing jeans, wearing Western clothes. And I didn't feel that the influence of Islam was as strong in Tunisia as a Muslim country, as I see the influence of Islam actively in Bradford in West Yorkshire. Very, 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 very interesting. And I think, you know, I think the key thing for the Tunisians is you say, uh, the tourism economy is important. That's what life's about. If you've got this wonderful island, you've got 30 effectively five-star hotels, you've got to fill them with tourists. And if you're in charge, you know that the economy is important because a poor economy leads to social unrest. So they want the tourists to come. They've got things to sell, they've got the infrastructure, it's how do you get them back? And I talked to friends in the tourism trade and they said it's like domino. It said if one of the carriers starts coming, then the others start coming. But uh, you know, there weren't the French carriers bringing people, there weren't the carriers, you know, I go occasionally, you know, often to, uh, to uh, on holiday to Tenerife, I sit there, I meet uh, lots of Danes. We discuss the TV program, Borgen, which is by the way, coming back this week, which is all about the Danish prime minister. And we meet Norwegian and they come because there's no sunlight in the winter up there. The Tunisians want them back, but they aren't coming yet. And that for Tunisia is the biggest challenge. Relations with Israel, as we know, is on a different plane. And uh, I don't think it's fair to talk to maybe the, the people who run the community in Jerba because they've got running it. But I'd like to talk, you know, to maybe the leadership in Tunis and say, where are we with that? My guess is that it's a difficult thing. And there has to be, I mean, when the Abrahamic Accords came, there was Jared Kushner wasn't there, who was like a broker. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure with Biden we'll see a broker, but maybe there will be a broker somewhere to see it happen. I see I got a question about, did I see any girls at school? Very interestingly, we went to a mixed school, Jewish and Muslim. I met some teenage Jewish girls there who were in school and uh, we talked about we talked about it and you know what are people going to tell you they're not going to tell you life is bad or whatever but if they're still there and there's obviously the opportunity to leave if they want to it must be that there, there's some there's something good there did i visit the great synagogue in tunis unfortunately not we were on uh, quite a tight tour i'd seen it from the outside before there's also a synagogue i think in zazis and very interestingly, when I was in Tunisia in 2014, this old Ashkenazi guy from Jerusalem who I'd met told me that they'd been driving all around Tunisia, visiting all the disused synagogues and cemeteries. So if we have a Jewish trip, maybe that's, uh, you know, those are the things that we should do. Are there any more questions? Well, can I ask a question about the origins of, of the Al Griva synagogue and the fact that only Kohanim seem to have made it across to uh, Jerba. Can you give us more information about I, this? I'm not an expert on it, but I know that Ezra the scribe, Ezra the sofa, asked Levine to come from Jerba. There's a, some story, you know, in the annals of history, you have to look it up, but there's a story, and they didn't come. And he said that no Levine should be on Jerba. So uh, when we go, we have to take a lady, because at least then they can call someone up Shaney, second the Levy, the Levy area. But uh, there, there is an overwhelming number of Kahanim on there, maybe because most of the Jews are Kahanim and married Kahanim, that's where they're there. Certainly my friend from Tunisia, who's in Leeds, you know, he's not, he's not from a Kahanic family. He's a uh, Yisrael like me. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? Please do write them in the chat. Um, perhaps we can ask 
Danielle, if if she's uh, around and if her microphone is is working, to talk about how and when she left Tunisia. Apparently, she left in 1963. Danielle, are you there? No, six, six yeah, 63. I left. Right. Yeah. Uh, what what circumstances did you leave uh, Tunisia? <sighs> Well, what happened is uh, since 1956 already, when Tunisia became independent, uh, there were quite a lot of problems. And um, in 1961, we had the uh, Bizert War, and it became more and more difficult. Uh, I didn't go to school for quite a while because I had to have my passport made um, because my father said we will have to leave one day. And the passport, had to be without profession because student was a profession and they used to send the students uh, to all the little towns and little villages to teach the Arabs because the French had left. So they used to take uh, the um, Jewish student that had, that had the Bagrod, the baccalaureate, to teach in those, and my father was not keen on that. So we had to have a passport without profession. So I didn't go to school for a while until I had my passport. And then in 63, some crisis uh, occurred to my father at work. And I went with my mother and my brother to uh, France. My mother had to go to a spa in Chateau Guyon. My father joined, said, we're not going back. Mm -hmm. And this is how in 1963, it was, it was a ranch, really. Um, but it was afterwards, a lot of people came uh, in 67 and afterwards. But uh, what I was going to say about the, um, the Riba is that the legend once says that they, when the temple, the second temple was destroyed, the Nicanor gate of the temple floated all the way to Djerba. And this is what were used to build the synagogue, the doors of the synagogue. Right. And that's why it's such a holy place. It has that. Uh, as a real problem. Right. And the question I'd last to ask Danielle is when you left, you went, did you go to France and did you leave everything yes. behind? Yes, like everybody else. We went to France. Uh, we, we, we lived in Lyon. And my, my brother actually made Alia, he was still in, was still in Lyon. Uh, but when I got married, I went to live in England. And did you leave everything behind in Tunisia? <laughs> everything. Yeah. Everything we left with one suitcase each, not even, and about uh, thirty-five dinar at the time, which was hardly anything. Yeah. yeah. Did you, have you been? We left uh, everything: uh, library, furniture, everything. Have you been back? No, oh, too scared. Too scared. <laughs> I can understand that. Too scared. Yeah. I mean, whether anyone would notice you were Jewish when you went, went back, I don't know. I mean, certainly wandering around Tunis is a very interesting thing, you know, is wandering around an Arab city. People seem, you know, and I look like a Westerner. People seem very, very friendly. They wanted to talk to you to do business. And, uh, you know, but if you've got I memories, know. it's a different thing. You know, when I arrived in, when I was in France for years and years and years, I had dreams of the, my flat in Tunis, my bedroom, my school. I had terrible, I had dreams, dream all the time. It's, you know, it feels like a golden ages of my life, but really it was for me as a young, young child, a teenager and so on, but it was not easy for, for my parents, my, my father. Yeah. Michelle asks a question, did you leave in secret? I mean, did you, did you not tell anyone you were leaving? Um, my mother just about told me that um, we might not go back. That's what she told me. No, we didn't leave in secret, we went because my mother had to go uh, to have some uh, treatment uh, in France. So we went, but uh, no, no, we, uh, it wasn't a secret secret, but <laughs> my mother told me, because my passport was without profession, although I had gone back to school, my mother told me to uh, make myself uh, like stupid, you know, in the, air, in, the, um, in the port, because we went by uh, my, my boat. And, <laughs> and the, um, when she went through security to custom, they said to her, what, your daughter? 
She's not a student. She said, no, no. Why? Because she had to help me. I'm not, a, I'm a sick woman. She had to help me. My mother said to me, she was looking at me. She said, you never look so stupid in your life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have another question about how, how could you organize a trip? And I've thought about that. And I wondered the best thing would be to contact the French organizer of the trip and say, if you had a group from Britain, how could you and effectively join on from that? And it may be that you'd fly everyone from airports in the UK to Paris, and then they could fly direct to Gerba with a French group. Always interesting putting French Jews and English Jews together, as some of you may know, if you've been in the damn panorama hotel in the summer around the swimming pool. But uh, that to me would be the best way because they've got all the infrastructure. And if they're running a kosher tour, it's not hard to put an extra 30 people into a restaurant rather than you starting from scratch. I met somebody today in, Man in, in, in Jerusalem here. He went to Jay's also Tunisian. He went to Jerba. He said there were 5,000 people in Jerba, 2,000 of whom were Israelis. Right. Mm -hmm. But I didn't hear much, much Hebrew spoken, to be very truthful. But I can believe, you know, I can believe in it. It suited the Tunisians to say a lot of people were there. How many were there? I'm not going to, you know, I didn't do a, do a head count or I couldn't say. But I can imagine a lot of Israelis get through. Whether they go through on Israeli or French passports, I don't know. Right. Yeah, um, yeah oh yeah, well, they haven't got any other passport, the Israelis, usually. I've got, I still got my Tunisian passport, which is, which is, which has expired a long time ago. And I could actually renew it if I wanted to. So I see that Michelle Hoven says that Rabbi Elias from Lauderdale organizes trips to uh, Jerba, and Frank Helmer says he led a Jewish group to El Gribu in 1990 as a liberal rabbi and was made very welcome. I'm sure they make everyone very welcome who comes. It's just the barrier of getting there and uh, the belief of getting there. Right. Um, so just to say that um, I think it's uh, Samish, Samish has added to um, this um, uh, information we have about the, the early settlers in Tunisia. Uh, he said he's read that the majority of the priestly caste migrated to Jerba after the first temple uh, destruction, uh, after the destruction of the first temple. And that's why there are so many Kohanim there. Mm. Right. Yeah, and I see Anthony Scott Norman's made a comment, and you know he says he had a he had an aunt from Sfax. There were Jewish communities not just in Tunis and Jerba, but in the other main cities as well. And you know there are still synagogues, cemeteries to visit. You know it's a question of uh, you know you can't do everything in the same way as Jewish groups come to Britain to visit synagogues and especially cemeteries. I don't know why, but whenever you meet a Jewish tourists, they always say to you, having shown you the synagogue. Where's the bet crawl up? Where's the cemetery? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Oh. I, I must say, oh, Samish has got a question. He's got his hand up. Do you want to unmute him? Hello, Samish. I can't see Samish on the list, darling. He's not there. Yes, he is. He's not on the alphabetical list. I don't know what name is under. Look. Ben Said. Ben Said. All right. Sorry, just coming to you. Okay, now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the reason I just wanted to ask. Uh, uh, did you encounter some sort of like uh, a guide that could give you like you, you went to the synagogue, right? Or to the Griba right. synagogue. Were there any somebody who could explain the history and give you sort of like a synopsis of what happened and why and, and all that stuff? Because that would be very instructive to the people who visit. They're not just go visit and have fun. I mean, we know? went for the Griba. There were literally thousands of people there. It was food and a party and everything like that. So I'm sure there are people. Who can, who can do it. You know, if I went on a regular Shabbat and I said to them, you know, tell me more about it, there were people, I'm sure that I have people, you know, most communities have someone who will guide you around. I guide people around West Yorkshire. They come to me and say, will you take me? And I'm sure, you know, if we went, if we went to Jerba, and in a sense, because there was the whole balagan and there are all these people there, it's not the time to ask 
shall we say, the difficult questions or the hard questions and to get everything in. It was more about a festivity. But if you were there on a, you know, on a quiet group, then I'm sure you could get that. And you, there's a guy called, I think it's, there's a guy in Paris called Trebelsky, who's very much involved with the Jerva community. And I know he can help. Right. And there's someone uh, saying his grandfather's grandparents came from Tunis in the 1880s. Uh, Sonia, yeah. yeah. Sonia, who has a marmoul recipe. <laughs> and it, she says it was interesting to see that one of the traders shared a family name. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Frank Helner would like to ask a question. Find it. There's so many names. <laughs> okay, it's, it's Valerie Hilnes speaking. Um, yes, we went to um, to Gerba twice. We'd read about the El Riva festival and approached the tourist board who invited us along and we went to the El Riva festival and the following year led the synagogue tour there. But one of the interesting things we saw, and I don't know if they still do it, is not in Trabat, before that, I think it must be either on the Sunday or a weekday, we went into the synagogue and there was a rabbi there. People were queuing up to get a blessing from him. And um, he blessed them and they gave him some money or put some money in his um, pushka. And then they both had a drink of bucha. Mm. And this was going on and on all day. <laughs> Certainly that happened at the Griba. Bucha is uh, like a rack. Yes. Tunisian Jewish drink. And uh, and the other a, pushka, thing, a pushka is a charity box, which is a nice Yiddish word. I'm not sure what's the Sfadi word for a charity box. Do <laughs> they have one? A Sadaka uh, box? Sadaka, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the other but, uh, yeah, I, saw, I mean, it was going on at the Gribber all the time. You know, people, there was a whole group of people, and it was like income for the people from the, you know, it was a way to get funds for the shawl. There were two guys sitting at the table. You gave them some money either in euros or in Tunisian dinar, uh, dinars. They said some prayers for you. You said, oh, man, you felt good. They've got money for the community. And it was that going on. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, and, and I think some people listening will have to tell me, but I think, you know, there's a whole custom in the Sephardi world of blessing, which is done maybe in the Hasidic world, but the normative Ashkenaz world doesn't in the same way go for it. And then in the courtyard, the other side of the synagogue, they were wheeling um, a cart round with a huge sort of tower on it on which there were lots of brilliantly colored scarves and belts and things, and they were auctioning them. And people were paying a lot of money for these things. And it really, it was a Tzedaka thing. It was really to raise money, but it was just lovely to see. And it was so exciting. Yes, so, uh, so if, you, if you go there, they do auction the alley off, off on Lake Boma. If you look at the Parisian women who come and you look at the jewelry you wear, you'll see that they're, you know, they've done well in Paris. And uh, I think, you know, many of the Jews who come from France are comparatively well off. Right. Anybody else wants, wants to say anything? Yeah. Point? Right. So Sarah says, I don't think it matters if you are Ashkenazi or not. I went to Jerba in very early in 1980s. I wanted to know about the culture. Um, and she puts, why should it be different going to Tunisia? I only put that because of the Greba. If you went on your own, you and you could speak French and find lots of people to talk to. But I think many of the people, because they come as groups and because they were French speakers and often weren't Hebrew speakers, which I speak, there was a, a slight insularity, you know? It's like meeting a group from Manchester and trying to move into it or a group from Northwest London. When you're there on your own, it's different. It's different, yeah. 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 And I'm sure uh, from the security point of view, the, I mean, the, the Tunisians would rather people traveled as a group, obviously it's much safer that way. That's right. And they can look after them. Right. Right. So roll on like Bomas to, you know, 5783. Okay. A, a yep. London group there, or a, a UK group. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Nigel. You've done a, a wonderful job. Thank you for, um, you know, um, taking us on a virtual trip uh, to Gerba. You know, I, f I feel I've been there somehow. 
<laughs> but obviously it would be lovely to uh, experience it in um, you know in person oh Michelle says she was in Gerba uh, in 2002 and missed the synagogue bombing by 24 hours my goodness me do you want to say something about that Michelle Yes, I've, I've been to Gerba. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, I've been to Gerba a couple of times. It's lovely. There used to be a club med there, um, which used to be great in the day. Um, and there, there were always tours to the synagogue. You could always go to the synagogue there. Um, it, and I remember the first time I went going on the tour and learning the history and everything. Um, the, when I went in 2002, I don't know why it was, it had become so touristic, the island from when I was there previously, it was full of German tourists and everything, all going to the synagogue and it kind of lost it for me and I didn't go. Um, and then literally as I landed back in London, because um, you went via Paris, um, I learned I'd just missed the bomb literally so by 24 hours so that was quite a shake up yeah and there's a memorial plaque for german tourists who are killed within mm -hmm. the compound mm -hmm. yeah, something like 19 of them who, yeah, who, who died in that army but certainly you know there if you go back you know in the recent history there have been a, a number of partic not particularly pleasant events in tunisia uh, synagogues being attacked uh, schools being you know ransacked Remember, the PLO were also evacuated to Tunis from Israel. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and you've got Libya next door. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness me. Uh, let's finish on a happy note. You know, yes. Let's... As, uh, as Michelle said, she went when there was club med, when there was life, when there was activity. And that's what they want to restore back. They've got all the infrastructure. What they haven't got is the tourists. And Judith remembers going to Club Med as well. Um, and um, is that the one in, in Gerba? It must be the one in Gerba. Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, let's look to the future. Let's hope things improve and um, let's all meet on the beach um, in Gerba. Yeah, we'll, we'll have We'll have a lockdown lecture from yes. Gerba about that. <laughs> okay right so uh lawrence are we going to do our usual if you want to so stop recording now, i now. will yeah we will stop recording and then open it up to everybody 